G'day everyone, today I'm here with uh, Simon Bennett and Rick Mitchell of OLSAP and uh, we're going to be talking about the history of ZAP, uh, what's happening with ZAP at the moment and how you can get involved. So welcome Rick and Simon. Thank you very much Andrew. Thank you Andrew. Okay, um, obviously ZAP has a rich history including a predecessor project. Can you tell us about how it got going? Sure, uh, so I think it was 2009 and I was a, I led a small Java team, um, uh, I was a developer and team leader, and we developed a new online service for a rather large um, FTSE 100 company uh, where I worked, and because it was quite um, critical, we uh, made sure that we ha it was, had security testing, so we got the pen testers in, and the whole idea was that the pen testers would just show that we'd done everything right and everything was fine. Unfortunately, they didn't go quite like that, um, and they found a whole load of vulnerabilities, including some I'd never heard of. Um, so, they found a cross-site scripting vulnerability I had heard of, but then things like cross-site request, request forgery and stuff like that, and it was, it was not good, um, and I was not in a good place. So, I decided, right, have to change this, and I, you know, I very much um, saw myself as a developer, and I wanted to make sure that the software I developed was. Um, it was performant, it, it, it um, uh, was scalable, it was maintainable, did everything it wanted, but also secure. You know, that was just one of the other categories of, of um, things that I wanted to make sure it, 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 um, it, it, it was good at. So I realized I didn't know about enough about security, so I started learning. Um, the guys who did the test told me about OWASP, which I'd never heard of. So I started with the OWASP Top 10, um, but I really wanted to... Um, learn more and I learn best by playing around with things so I started downloading open source security tools and I was also looking for I decided I wanted to find a, an open source tool that I could use for actually testing my applications and automating that testing so that I wouldn't get embarrassed by things like this cross-site scripting vulnerability that slipped through mm -hmm. um, so I started doing that started playing around with the tools um, and I was kind of surprised to find out there weren't any actively maintained web security tools out there, open source ones, none at all. Mm -hmm. uh, there, were, uh, there was Web Scarab, um, but that wasn't really being maintained. I didn't get on with it. There was a tool called Paros, which I quite liked. Um, it couldn't, you couldn't automate it. It was just a desktop-based tool. Um, but it was fun and you know, something I, could, I found I got used to. And so I started playing around with that. And I was also looking for an open source project uh, to get involved with, um, an active one which would um, possibly security related. Uh, as it was, I started playing around with these tools and I started giving um, talks to people I've worked with, particularly around the OWASP top 10. And I was talking very much to developers and functional testers QA. And the first question everybody asked was, which tools should we use? So I started looking around that, okay, I'll see what I can really recommend. And the closest thing I could find was Paros. Although it wasn't actually Paros, it was a version of Paros I was hacking around with myself. Because Paros was written in Java, I was a Java dev. There were some things that annoyed me about it, so I just got in there and started playing around with it. And I can still remember pulling pa the Paros source code into Eclipse, making a change, seeing it reflected and going, ooh, this is fun, I could, I could make something of this. <laughs> so <clears throat> uh, that's where it started, and in the end I thought, okay, I will release Paros, um, my fork of Paros. I didn't want to call it Paros again, so I called it Zap. Um, and then I offered it to, to OWASP as a project. I didn't hear back for a couple of months, but uh, then it did get accepted. Um, but the whole idea, Zap was, you know, I wanted something that I could play around with. Originally it was called, you know, the tagline was the security tool for developers, because that's what I was aiming for. And I was, you know, the whole idea of automation was definitely in my mind and something I wanted to focus on. It's just, it wasn't there at the time. It's something we've been building on ever since, really. Okay, cool. And uh, Rick, how did you get involved in uh, Zap's development? So I didn't join the project team until, I don't know, 2014 or 2015. And uh, my involvement grew out of uh, being a pen tester and using Zap and, um, you know, coming up with a couple of issues that I reported or whatever and seeing that you know fixing these things isn't really that difficult and i spend all day breaking things which is totally wonderful because who doesn't like to tell people they're doing something wrong right but i could build something too and i could help these guys so i started to get involved in doing some fixes and stuff 
And uh, after a couple of years, the guys invited me to the core team, and I've been working on it ever since. Awesome. So one of the things that's really great about Zap as one of our flagship projects is that not only does it have a great community, but you actually have categorized a number of bugs as good first-time help, you know, bugs to address. Um, just go through how do people start to get involved in helping Zap um, development or you know documentation or whatever the case may be that you need help with at the moment. I mean, one thing, Zap was always designed, intended to be a community project. I wanted it to be the open source community that I was looking for originally. So, um, you know, all the three project leaders were always trying to encourage people to get involved in helping them. Uh, Zap is a big project. We've got some like 36 repos or something like that in GitHub. Um, so it's big uh, and it's convoluted. There's a lot going on. Um, but the main thing is, you know, get in touch. Um, you can talk to any of the uh, project leaders, either directly or via um, the Google groups or via Twitter or any other way you can get hold of us. Um, and just say that you're interested. And then we can talk about, you know, are you interested in getting help, helping with the documentation? Do you want to get involved in coding in the core or in the add-ons or get involved with JavaScript and the heads-up display? There's millions of things to do and it's not just documentation coding there's loads of testing and trying zap out against well-known vulnerable applications there's a million things to do there's always way too much for us to do you know i've always said i could have a a, a very large team working full-time on zap which i haven't got but never mind you know can always hope yeah well that actually brings me to a thing we changed the grants process this year so projects can actually get funding and spend it on people working on the project we've also changed our corporate membership of around three or four months ago so that corporate members can actually donate part of their um the membership fee to a project or a chapter and that then helps that project do things so we're working on getting a like a list of grants that projects can actually that say I'd like to have X, Y, and Z funded if whatever, and that we can help direct corporate members to fund those particular projects. Um, given that information, what would you like people to work on if they could actually, uh, you know, get a bug bounty or a a, um, a little bit of money to develop a feature? Uh, I, I mean, there's there's always loads of things to do. And I mean, we've actually had a great deal of success with Google Summer of Code. So loads of students have got involved, created some great features, some great new things. And we actually have a student hall of fame on the Zap website so you can see all the great work they've done. Uh, so it really depends on what people want to get involved in. We want people to enjoy their time working on Zap. So it could be some completely new feature. It could be improving something existing. One of, one of the key ones, I think, uh, for me is things like scan rules. So we have a lot of scan rules, um, but some of them you know, could definitely be improved. We get false positives, we have false negatives. They're things we don't test for at all. And scan rules, I think, are some that are things which you, know, you don't need to understand all of the Zap um, project. There's, it's a relatively small section you need to understand. And it's maybe a bit better documented than some of the other places. We could always do better there. Uh, but if people, particularly if like the breaking side, um, then getting involved in scan rules is great. But it's, it's quite different from pen testing, whether you where you have one particular application, you're targeting that one application. With the scan rules, we are looking for categories of vulnerabilities, and you're trying to find that type of vulnerability across every possible um, application. So you don't know what people will be using Zap for, and try and work out different ways to find. SQL injection or cross-site scripting, all the other vulnerabilities. Uh, there's a lot of um, a lot of deep thought you need to be put into that. So it's a fun thing to get involved in. Um, both myself and uh, uh, Rick have worked on those. Um, and we know there's loads more to do. Absolutely. So you've mentioned Rick as well, but there are other core team members. Um, can you just um, give a shout out to some of the, the, the larger contributors to Zap? Sure. Well, I've got to mention Ricardo, um, THC202. Uh, he is, uh, he doesn't like um, coming on these kind of things. Um, so he's quite a private individual, but uh, everyone in the Zap community will know him because he's incredibly helpful. And he's really, I think, the reason why the Zap code base is so, uh, is so robust. Uh, he's done an incredible job and he's been working on Zap with me for nearly as long as he's been going. 
uh, so he's great. Um, and then we've had various students who've been uh, typically worked on things like Google Summer of Code, and um, anyone who st stays working on Zap for a length of time gets invited to the core team. And we've got Akshat at the moment, who's um, been uh, in the core team for a couple of years now and um, working on some great features and currently working on out-of-band testing. That's actually really important. Uh, for folks who um, aren't particularly familiar with out-of-band testing, obviously there are things like SSRF and other things which could generally benefit and DNS attacks and whatnot. Could you describe some of those features? Sure. I mean, so <clears throat> out-of-band testing is very different from the usual um, thing where you have your um, your tool like Zap and you have a target application and then Zap will attack the target application, get some sort of responses, and based on that you can work out whether the application is likely to be vulnerable. This case is very different because you attack the application, but the attacks actually mean the application contacts a th a th another service. And that's quite, that's hard to detect, particularly um, if, because you need these other services. And up until now, we haven't had um, enough people to be able to develop those things. However, there are, I think, about three or four different open source um, out of band service. Um, services which will detect these things are now available and so what Akshat has been doing is working with these services and integrating with them, them with Zap so you can actually choose which one and you can either use they're all open source um, so you can you there are some on um, free op um, versions you can just use online anyone can use or you can set your own version up um, so it's very powerful and uh, yeah we're really looking forward to seeing that um, develop oh that's fantastic I think one of the things that many people don't realize, particularly if they come from a commercial tool point of view, is just how scriptable Zap is. You said at the very beginning you wanted to be able to automate testing, and I think that's one of the highlights of Zap's capabilities, is just the sheer range of automation capabilities. Um, can you just go into it a little bit? Like, you've obviously got Zest, you've got APIs, you've got... What, how, how can developers use Zap in their workflow? So, I mean... I believe that Zap is the uh, most automatable uh, web security tool out there, including all of the commercial ones. It's something we've really focused on. Uh, the initial focus was very much on the API, and the API allows you to control Zap nearly as effectively as if you were um, sitting in front of it when in front of the desktop. Uh, that is still a very powerful option. It's not going away. We've had, for a long time, we've had some package scans. Uh, they, these run in Docker, and they make it very easy to do things like a baseline scan where you just do, a, a, say, a one-minute spider and just um, look for passive, uh, passively detect potential vulnerabilities. That's very, effect that's very quick and effective. It won't find the injection-type vulnerabilities like cross-site scripting and SQL injection, but it will find missing headers and other security controls. So it's great, particularly because you can put it in continuous integration because it only takes a minute or two to run. Then we've got um, the package scans for the full scan and the API scan where you can import API definitions. Uh, but those only work in Docker uh, for historical reasons and uh, they they are extensible but they get a bit um, convoluted when you have to add load when you try to extend them. So we've got a new automation framework and the automation framework uh, basically you, you supply a YAML file and the YAML file configures everything that Zap needs to know and it defines a set of jobs so you can run the, the jobs like um, the standard spider, the Ajax spider, the active scan and what we're doing is we're extending that to cover pretty much all of the Zap functionality and what it means is um, we're actually migrating the package scans to use the automation framework under the hood so what will happen is if you actually have um, a package scan, you'll be able to just um, add a command and it will generate the, um, the YAML file for you. But also, um, we've got integration with the UI as well. So you'll actually be able to use the UI, set up everything you want to. And this is what we've always recommended, you know, if you're testing a new application and you want to do in depth, it's always good to test it with the UI and then automate from there. But we've not had a good story about how you go from the desktop configuration to the API calls. But now what we'll be able to do is you can just, uh, with a couple of press a couple of buttons and it will generate the YAML for you, exactly what you've set up. 
Um, so it means you'll be able to test things and debug them in the desktop and then generate this YAML file. And it includes um, some extra nice features. So there are extra tests in it that you can add. So, because one thing's always concerned me is when you set up automation, how do you know it's always working? You know, you set it up and you, and you kick it off and it works fine for a while, but then what happens if it breaks? Are you yeah. checking that it's doing what you think? And I had a case when, when I worked at Mozilla where I set up a Zap scan and got the authentication all working and then the team actually changed how the authentication worked underneath the hood, underneath the covers. Um, luckily, I was monitoring that and I detected it and worked and then <clears throat> was able to fix it. Um, but that's kind of built into the automation framework. So when you run the spider, uh, by default, you'll get a check to see um, how many URLs it finds. And you can check different responses. There's a whole load of different things you can check, including all of the stats that Zap maintains. And that includes all of the stats to do with authentication as well. So you can check that you are actually getting, you know, the number of roughly the number of authenticated requests that you expect. So it actually provides more features than you kind of get out of the box in Zap. Um, That's really cool. One thing I could probably recommend from my time with Jekyll is please provide a YAML linter so you can find the odd space that's wrong or the tab that should be a space or a space that should be a tab. It's very pernickety. Um, the, there's so many people who get stuck breaking their uh, repos um, because there was a one additional space or a space not in the right place. So a linter for YAML would be fantastic. <laughs> that sounds like a very good plan. Yeah, people, have, I think someone's mentioned that before, but I'll make sure that's on the list. I okay. said, you can actually generate these YAML files from within a Zap desktop, in which case it will generate it correctly. But yeah, people will create their own and then there will be mistakes. There'll be typos. We know that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Rick. Thinking about the future, what are your top three priorities? I'll ask Simon this, this question in a little tick as well, but I just want to get your view on where do you want to see Zap go in the, in the future? Oh, wow. That's kind of a loaded question. Um, where do I want to see Zap go? Well, uh, there's a couple um, longstanding issues um, that I guess uh, I would like to address or see addressed. Um, one of those being persistent um, settings for the fuzzer. Um, I, I, it's one that we've had going for a long time and nobody has decided to tackle. I think we even have um, a bug bounty on it that's, um, you know, a couple hundred bucks. But uh, I, I don't really care about the money. I just want people to be able to use the tool more effectively. So that's one I can see tackling sometime soon. Um, there's always more scripting to do. And uh, like Simon mentioned earlier, scan rules. I can definitely see myself working on um, more scan rules or advanced versions of scan rules um, to increase our coverage. Yeah, one of the things that I was doing with the, um, I, I think a lot of projects have a problem with bootstrapping new contributors. And um, mm -hmm. one of the things that I failed to do it as the OVIS developer guide lead is bootstrap new people into the project to keep it going. And so obviously it's fallen by the wayside. Um, obviously Zap is a very large code base. Do you think um, working on documentation or uh, introductory how to hack on Zap courses, or is there anything like that in the wiki at the moment? There is content on the website for um, kind of getting started with the dev environment and stuff. Um, there's some older blog posts on hacking Zap and creating scan rules and scripts and um, getting at this some different parts of the code base. Um, as Simon was saying earlier, there's always documentation that can be updated or created, but there are definitely resources out there to help people get started. For sure. Cool. So Simon, I'll ask the same question of you. What, mm -hmm. are, what are the top three priorities from your point of view? So uh, automation and the automation framework is a big focus for me at the moment. Um, and and so and that always will be for for Zap. I think we we know a lot of people are using that. Um, I think the scan rules, as I've mentioned before, the other thing is modern web applications. Um, we know that security tools in general have problems with modern web applications. Um, we have features in Zap to handle them, but there are lots more we could do. Um, lots of ideas just haven't had enough time or people to um, try and put them to in practice yet. 
Um, so, if, you know, um, particularly, and it requires a different set of skills, particularly a lot of um, JavaScript knowledge and a lot of front-end um, browser-type knowledge. So if anyone wants to get involved in that, we've got loads of funds and things you can work on. Cool. Yeah, I was um, helping out with a um, Node.js application that recently transitioned to Vue, and there was just bugs after bugs after bugs because, well, no one was testing it, um, the Vue code. And Vue is actually incredibly testable, but you do need to actually learn about Jest. You need to actually understand the framework and what the JavaScript is actually doing under the hood. And of course, you've got TypeScript there as well, just transpiling it and whatnot, and just understanding what it's trying to achieve. It's actually rather challenging. Um, even with the source code, it's challenging. <laughs> so, okay, that's awesome. Okay, so uh, obviously the community voted um, Zap as its community project of the year. Um, and I do hope to see at some point in the future that um, we can recognize this at a proper project summit. We're thinking about actually holding a proper project summit next year, which is going to be great. Um, maybe Excellent. in combination with the Open Security um, Summit itself. We're not sure yet. We're just working on that. Um, do you uh, see yourself getting together um, for a project summit in 2022? Or is it sort of a, a once COVID dies down type of deal? Guy, it's interesting because I mean the Zap Core team. I, we've, n I mean, I've, I don't think I've ever actually met Rick, have I? I don't think we've nope. not met in person. Um, nope. I've met Ricardo once. I've never met Akshat. Um, we actually are used to working remotely um, in our own time zones, in our own way. Um, we communicate a lot on um, IRC. So we haven't actually met up at any of the project summits. Um, it would be nice to, uh, but Absolutely. we are, I mean, we work together, uh, you know, pretty much every day. Um, so I talk to the rest of the core team every single working day. So it's not like some projects where nothing happens until everyone gets together for a week. Um, so, yeah, it would be great to meet everyone in person. I would really like that. But... Um, it's not holding us back, and yeah, we'd have to see when it is and what everyone's up to. Uh, but I like the idea. Um, but we are having ZapCon in uh, March, um, so that's online. So we won't be meeting in person there either. Okay. Um, so you know, there'll be loads of. T so if you want to submit a talk on Zap or you know, join that to listen up and find out what everyone else is doing, then please do. Awesome. And with that, thank you so much, both of you. And uh, I must say that I actually have met both of you separately. <laughs> <laughs> so, We've met through you. Great. Yeah. I'm, I might be the uh, Kevin Bacon of OWASP. <laughs> but anyway, I do hope to see you awesome. soon. And uh, thank you so much for all the hard work that you've put into Zap. I know that I use it on a regular basis. So again, thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. It was no good worries. to talk to you today. Definitely. No